Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Today I have with me Katharina Dress. She is an elder family mediator, facilitator, and a conf- conflict coach and trainer. And you have a book called Aging in Harmony? Not no. a book. Okay. That's my business. That's the business name. Okay, thank you. I, have, I talk to a lot of authors, so I get confused sometimes. So I know from talking to guests that there's a lot of families that don't agree on much of anything, Mm -hmm. which I am very grateful. My sister and I are polar opposite personalities and we haven't had too much conflict yet. Hopefully we won't have any. So how do you, how does somebody go about finding a person? I never didn't know that people like you existed. I've learned so much doing this podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, and that's what I hear from pretty much anybody I meet, that they don't know that somebody like me exists. That's my biggest challenge, actually. Um, But more and more, um, when people just Google, you know, family conflict about aging parents or something like that, they'll find me or other people like me. Um, And... um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big challenge because it's, um, as you know, as people are aging and there's more dementia and families are spread out, um, there is more conflict and it's hard. And, and so it's a relatively new profession. Mediation in, in and of itself is, you know, a relatively new profession. But people usually know that there is such a thing as like a business mediator or a divorce mediator. But uh, adult family mediation or elder care mediation, not so well known yet. So I'm really glad you're helping me put out the word today. Oh, well, you're welcome. And I have my support group tonight, so I will make sure to let them know. I I haven't heard too many horror stories of family conflict, but... I'm sure they're there. So yeah. people need to know that there's options because when you're dealing with somebody like my mom who's got advanced Alzheimer's and my sister and I, for example, don't agree on what we should be doing, it would be nice to have a third party be able to step in. Especially, like I said, she and I are completely polar opposite personalities. So agreement is rare with us. <laughs> so, um, We've managed to be adult and and move forward in a positive manner with mom, so that's all good. That's wonderful. Um, as a facilitator, I also help people, uh, families, when they th- when somebody in the family thinks it's time to make a plan, and people don't agree on that, or there's resistance on the part of the elder, I bring families together and uh, organize kind of elder care planning meetings. So you don't have to wait till there is a manifest conflict. (laughs) It's so much better to make decisions before a crisis hits. Mm -hmm. So that's also something I can help with. Now have you worked with, I've got somebody specific in mind, a person whose family member is in complete denial that they have a problem and need help? Yes. Okay. That is very common. It is. Um, and I mean, I know you have more experience with people with dementia than I do, but one of the things that I've known through education over time is that um, that's one of the first symptoms of dementia is to not be able to adequately assess the consequences of your actions. So. Because you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. If you don't remember that you keep leaving things on the stove and burning right. things, or right. I have this one particular person, her mom loses the very expensive car key all the time and mm-hmm. shouldn't be driving, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's an issue. And you know, obviously, if you don't remember that you know you drove for hours and hours and, and it right. took took forever to get someplace that should have taken twenty minutes. One of the things no that I help with is rather than trying to persuade the person Mm -hmm. who may not 
be able to see the reality of the situation um, is to turn it around and share how the adult children or whoever the loved ones are who are concerned about the elder, how they are feeling. So for instance, to say, you know, mom, I really love you and I'm really sad that I don't live that nearby. I can't be with you every day. And so I worry about you a lot. And one of the things I worry about is, you know, when I hear about all the people getting into accidents, as an example, right? And would you be willing maybe to look at alternatives to driving yourself as a gift to me, to give me peace of mind. That way, the elder never has to admit that there is something that maybe they need help or maybe they are, their driving isn't so safe anymore. So that really helps them keep their self-image and, and also their sense of independence because if you voluntarily choose other options of transportation to make your kids happy, that's your decision, right? So it's a, it's a different form of independence. Which is, you know, it's important. I, I did uh, about three weeks ago an episode, it was my first live episode, so it was kind of crazy. I talked to one of our local uh, police sergeants on driving safety mm -hmm. because giving up the car keys is really hard especially I live in the suburbs like where my house is it's literally just under three miles to the grocery store and to get home is up a pretty steep hill I'm mm -hmm. a cyclist so I know what that hill feels like mm -hmm. and I'm not throwing a gallon of milk on my bike and because I'd have to end up walking if I put enough additional weight on my bike I would have to walk up the hill so it's you know our City planning is not, they, it, it needs a rapid shift towards, yeah. in, you know, a lot of them, this is like a whole other <laughs> podcast, but on planning for, you know, more affordable housing and more seniors that might be living alone or seniors that live together that, you know, like they can walk to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Can't walk to the grocery store. You know, I live, like I said, it's, it's a mile in from the main road up the hill mm -hmm. so you know it's not like there's a bus stop I'd have to walk literally probably yeah. seven eighths of a mile down the hill to get to the bus stop yeah. driving transition is, is a big big issue and it's often one of the first issues where um, conflicts arise and so I can definitely help with that and fortunately there are alternatives to driving these days mm -hmm. that are accessible to seniors you know even uh, like Uber and Lyft offer services where you can call as if you're calling a taxi. If it's set up by, for instance, your adult children, the payment, you know, right. the online stuff is set up ahead of time. But then the senior themselves can call it, you know, a ride share service. Like in the old days, they would have called the taxi, but it's much cheaper, of course. I have a grandmother who's 101 and a half. Oh unfortunately outlived my dad who was her oldest son but she she's mostly blind from glaucoma mm -hmm. but she refuses to consider a taxi because she's afraid she will be taken advantage of or assaulted or some negative thing and you know we're out in the suburbs so I'm, I'm, I would think that the that fear is pretty overblown but I know that that's one of the problems she but refuses it's real for her right and there are other alternatives um, there are there is um, a service that's called arrive where you become a member and then they call the right share for you but they stay on the phone until you're in the car and make sure that you're safe and that you feel comfortable so you know even with an old-fashioned, you know, flip phone, <laughs> which I think she has. Yeah, you 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 can call them and you get to know them because there's only like three different staff, you know, that might be on the phone. So you get to know them, and it's it's as if your daughter is calling a ride for you and stays on the phone with you until you really feel comfortable. 
So, so th I don't want to go into the details. Yeah. But, but what this has to do with what I do is that um, I help people really hear and understand each other's concerns. So in the case of your grandma, she's really concerned about safety, right? And just validate that rather than saying, oh, it's safe, to say, okay, what can we do to meet your need for safe, feeling safe, right? And there are, there, there is such an abundance of creative solutions out there that we can't possibly all know about. That's true. But it's part of my job to know a lot about it. And while I don't um, recommend particular solutions, I facilitate conversations in such a way and ask questions in such a way that people can come up with different creative solutions that they never would have thought of on their own. I'm a pretty creative person and there's, it gets difficult when you're trying to take the emotion out of it. I know with my grandmother, she feels like, well, family should just do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, my dad had his chronic health issues and he was dealing with my mom and they were about 20 to 30 minutes away. And it was like, it's not real practical. And my sister and I are the only, out of the four granddaughters, there's Oh, oh no, there's five grandkids. I always forget about my kid's cousin because he's younger than my daughter. You know, there's two of them live out of the state, and then my sister and I have our own kids and our own jobs, and it's like, you know, and our parents' story about her at the time, parents now just mom. So it's like, I don't have time to deal with you too. And so that's, that's one of our biggest challenges is just her assumption that, well, family should just handle it. You're right. And that's very common too mm -hmm. because. You know, life has changed in the last hundred years. So it used to be much more possible, you know, before women worked, for instance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and things have changed. And again, um, when she says, I think family should do it, that's just one possible solution, but there are underlying longings or needs. Why she wants family to do it which is for instance safety and familiarity and that's how I help people hear and understand each other really ask the question like when you imagine family doing something for you what what does that give you how does that feel to you you know so you understand it's really about that sense of safety and familiarity so then when you can introduce again to go to the um, example that I was using earlier when you can introduce the person from arrive and she becomes like a friend of the family right then you can bridge that gap because there is that sense of familiarity and safety that would be with a family member so there's in my world there's always a solution once we really understand what it's really about well I think asking that question is more effective from I don't want to say a stranger, but a, a neutral third party than if I asked it of her. Of I don't think I'd get the same answer. Of course. It's really, the dynamic is completely different when you have a neutral third party facilitating a conversation, both because they are unrelated, unknown, um, don't have any stake in the outcome, uh, but also because I'm trained to lead the conversation in a different way that, you know, the average person wouldn't. Well, and it gets difficult when you're dealing with family because then emotions and baggage all comes up and <laughs> not always a good thing. I've heard you mention emotions a couple times and what I do is not steering people away from the emotions at all, quite the opposite. I help people express their emotions in a safe way and dig deeper what's below the emotions. I believe that emotions are kind of like little red flags that are intended to steer us towards the deeper longings or needs that are not being met. And so when we really listen to the emotions, we can ask questions that lead to a deeper understanding. So that training, is that why somebody would contact you versus like an attorney or a social worker? 
Um, definitely why somebody would uh, contact me rather than an attorney because, you know, I, I work with the emotions rather than trying to steer away from the emotions. And, and I really have a lot of training in deep listening and helping people to listen to each other on a deeper level. Uh, social workers do too, but the big difference between a social worker is a social worker is trained to be an advocate. In their mind, one person is the client. Typically in these kind of cases, it would be the elder. They work with the whole family system but they see it through the lens of what's best for the elder. And everybody else has needs too, just mm -hmm. like you were saying, I have a life, I have a family, I have a career, right? So everybody else wants to be heard and understood and seen in the same way that the elder does. And so that's why uh, a mediator is a train, as a trained neutral isn't on anybody's side. I say I try my best to be omni-empathetic. I'm on everybody's side. That's excellent, probably not easy. And so that's also the difference. We've got elder care managers. I'm not entirely sure what an elder care manager does. Elder care managers are, are people who, you know, in a lot of families, like one adult daughter takes on everything that needs to be organized around what mom or dad needs, right? The doctor's visits, the evaluations, that was my the aunt. transportation, <laughs> yeah. So elder care manager plays that role. They're trained to make an assessment about what the person needs and then to put the elder together with the services that they need, whether it's medical or whether it's um, care, you know, home care, or whether they just need movement or transportation or companionship, they can arrange for all of that. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, I learn stuff all the time. <laughs> and you do mediation to make sure that all of that happens S seamlessly, might not be the right word, but it's close. I. I really just help with the communication piece about all this, right? Everybody involved. Usually it's the family members, but it can be professionals too. For example, I've had cases where a home care agency gets stuck in the middle between what the elder would like and what the bill paying children would like, right? And it can often lead to a lot of turnover. So it's not in their best interest either. So they can bring me in and the caregiving agency is a party, and the elder and the adult kids are the parties. <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily just have to be among family members. I can see that being a big challenge with the family and the elder and the, and the care agency. <sighs> that sounds like a headache. <laughs> but I'm sure they're lucky that they have somebody like you. Thank you. So is it mostly families that contact you though? It's mostly it's families, mostly it's you know, the adult child that takes the lead role in whatever needs to happen with mom or dad. And um, they usually contact me when they are running into a barrier, either nobody wants to talk about it or there's resistance either on the part of the older family member or on the part of the other siblings. You know, and as you know, in families, everybody tends to have a different opinion of what's best and everybody tends to be attached to their particular strategy so that's where I help have a conversation in a more connecting and more uh, productive way. That sounds super important. So the families are the typical participants in mediation? In the kind of mediation I offer, yes, but it can be professional. What is the, one of the most common issues that you've dealt with? Um, knowing that your focus is dementia, I want to say that in at least half of the families I work with, somebody is somewhere on the journey of dementia. So all the issues that come up around that um, can be discussed, you know, whether it's about driving transition like we talked about or whether it's about is it still safe for mom or dad to live alone or is it time to look at a senior community 
um, uh, do they need help at home and maybe you are not open to letting a non-family member help them. That how, sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, how can we help turn that around and find a solution that works for everybody? One baby step at a time usually. Um, my dad tried to not ramrod through because my grandmother is mostly blind mm -hmm. and lives alone, which she shouldn't be, and her house needs a lot of maintenance that she doesn't see because she can't physically see it. And, you know, I think after, after a while we, we miss a lot of the things that need to be done in our own homes until it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So that kind of mental just blocking it out. My daughter was in college and she needed like a job and my aunt had thrown up the red flag and said, I'm done, she's burned me out. I'm willing to do A, B, and C and that's it. And so my dad basically, you know, being the oldest son and being male and of a certain generation, he's like, okay. He researched salary range and he put together like a little, a list of what, like he, what he, his opinion was, she should hire my daughter, her great granddaughter, and my daughter would do like housekeeping, prepare meals that she could microwave, and transport her to the appointments that my aunt was done doing. Mm -hmm. And I understood where my aunt was coming from at the po at that time. And now I've had to drive my mom around to doctor's appointments, and the doctors are not real. You know, they I, I say I'm available on Mondays. Oh well, that doctor's not available on Mondays. Then find me a different. I'm going through that right now. It's like, you know, there's one of me. There are many of you. So let's work with the system here, okay? Because, you know, I can't... till January, I'm not available just randomly to spend three or four hours transporting my mom for yet another test for yeah. nothing. It's, you know, it's I it's know annoying. exactly what you mean. I have a close friend who had a stroke a year and a half ago, and I'm, I'm her power of attorney for health care. So I go through that. You know, I can't believe how they are just making appointments without even asking. Are you available? The patient and their support system, whether they're available, but that happens all the time. Yeah, it's I like... I really share your frustration about that. One of my goals, and it's a teeny tiny little step that I'm taking towards this goal, is to help educate the medical profession on how to deal with somebody like my mom and her care person, who is me, because mm -hmm. I'm the health care power of attorney for mom. Like, for example, she needed a blood test, and I walk in. My mom does not wait patiently, because, you know, she has no concept of time. So five minutes can feel like an hour to her. So mm -hmm. I understand this. We walk into the, the lab, and I say, you know, fortunately for me, my mom thinks I'm her best friend. So if I say, mom has Alzheimer's, <laughs> she doesn't realize I'm talking about her. That was kind of a, mm -hmm. a little light bulb that went off not that long ago. So I told this young gal, you know, my mom's got advanced Alzheimer's. She doesn't wait patiently. There was nobody in the waiting room, mm -hmm. so I figured we were safe. And she just kind of looked at me like, yeah, and? And I thought, okay, you know, I've informed you. You're, you're now dancing towards the danger zones. We go into the blood draw, and she literally said, looking at my mom, now can you tell me your first and last name and your date of birth? I'm like, honey, I barely understood that. Why don't you talk a little faster and she's just going to totally ignore you? Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what my mom did. My mom just looked at her like, eh, noise came out of your face, whatever. And I said, no, she can't. She doesn't remember her last name. She doesn't remember her date of birth. This is why I told you that she had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. You know, you have barely gotten us out of your line of sight. I understand the reasoning that they have to make sure that they're treating the right person. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess you're not going to draw blood from somebody who doesn't need it, but it's just standard protocol. But I'm like, you know, they all do that. They all act like she's totally fine. And then when she resists because she's frustrated with them, now they've caused a problem that I have to solve. And so I'm trying to yeah. educate in advance. And it's really frustrating because it's like, come on, guys. You know, I'm a artist person, I'm a photographer and a podcaster, I'm not in the medical profession, you should be teaching me, not the other way around, but yeah. that's... I really understand your um, frustration. And to get back to your previous question about <laughs> the kind of issues 
we discovered that you and I both are power of attorney for healthcare, and uh, so that's one of the things that is an issue. You know, powers of attorney for the person or for the finances. Do they have one? If yes, um, is that person willing to do it? Uh, is it the same person, or is it two different siblings? Do those siblings? get along because they have to work together um, or maybe there isn't a plan yet and how soon can we make a plan so that it can still be made legally before people are too far on the journey of dementia. <coughs> <coughs> I apologize. Oh, you're fine. <coughs> That's what the water is for. <laughs> you know, I'm the healthcare power of attorney. That's something my dad set up. But my sister and I are co-trustees of their estate. Mm -hmm. So, I I have concerns that the fact that I've, as precarious as it feels, have developed a working relationship with the doctors. I mm -hmm. love my mom's neurologist, even though the woman is always an hour behind schedule. Mm -hmm. I know how to work with that now. We just go across the parking lot to the, it's either a Starbucks or a hamburger place, and we get something to drink. And we wait, and they call me on my cell phone and say, okay, we're going to be ready for her in a few minutes, and we head back across the parking lot. So this is, you know, this is all I've managed, you know, I don't like having to waste an hour or entertain my mom at a restaurant, but, you know, I asked my sister for help with the hair and nail appointment. The salon gal goes to get my mom, and my mom just randomly decides I'm not going with you, or I'll go with you, but you're not cutting my hair, you're not trimming my nail, whatever. It's like, lady, I'm not driving over there just to take you to the salon person so I can sit there and stare at the walls. I asked for help with the salon with getting the hair and nails done because she takes my niece who's almost 14 mm -hmm. and I thought this is something they can have like a girl's day mm -hmm. and my sister's like well I'm really super busy da, 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 which she is but then she tells me that you know just give me just let me know what mom's doctor's appointments are I'm like honey those are like three hour treks so you gotta pick up mom you gotta move, get her and you gotta wait I mean it's it's even though it's literally around the corner it is just the most mm -hmm. drug out process. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, you don't have time to help with the hair and the nails, the easy thing, but you want to, mm -mm. I just ignored that one. <laughs> we haven't had any doctor's appointments since that text conversation, so. So that's, that's a conversation I can help with, you know, the division of labor between the siblings. And because when, when people suggest a particular one that they want help with, they have a reason, right? And if other people suggest a different one, they have a reason to. So again, I help people understand the underlying reasons mm -hmm. so we can together come up with solutions that meet everyone's needs. That makes sense. Yeah, I was a little surprised. I don't have to, you know, I'm super busy because I have a kid in high school and one in elementary school, which, okay, well, that's only moderately changed. My niece just started high school. I'm not sure how much busier she is because of that fact. And she thinks she has time for the doctor's appointment. So it kind of made me suspicious, which is, is not the appropriate way to approach the conversation. <laughs> well, to try curiosity without yeah. judgment, you know? Like, it's the, without judgment part yeah. of it. <laughs> I know that's really hard among family members. Why it is easier to have an outsider ask yeah, those questions. Yeah, definitely. So how many sessions is typical with families and a mediator at like yourself? There's nothing that's typical. <laughs> but um, I, one of the things, for instance, that's different about mediation than family therapy, which is a, you know, alternative some people consider, um, is that in mediation, the kind of mediation I offer, you only commit to one session at a time. Often people need more. I, and I also don't do mediations a whole day, a lot Ooh. of people do, but because I don't want to avoid the emotions, I want to create a safe space to feel the emotions, it's really exhausting. So yeah. three to four hours with a break in the middle is the maximum, and so people commit to one at a time, and then at the end, one of the agreements we make is about the next step. Do they want another session? and what's the purpose of the next session, and how long from now should it be, that sort of thing. Uh, I've mediated with people anywhere between one session and six sessions with the same family, 
And I would say the most common is two sessions. So in the first one, you know, all the issues come on the table and people hear and understand each other. And then they also figure out what it is that they don't know that they really need to have answers to in order to make informed decisions. And then we can make a plan who gets what information by when, and then we can schedule a second session where everybody brings in what they researched and then we have a foundation to actually make solutions and make decisions about the solutions. That sounds really helpful. I'm like really glad that we connected because I have a feeling we might need you. <laughs> <laughs> so where where do you do your mediations? Do people come to your office? I don't have an office. I work out of my home. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> and partially for my own benefit, but also for the benefit of the client because it means I do my work wherever it's most convenient to the client. You know, I serve people all the way in the Greater Bay Area and beyond, and I do all the pre-mediation, you know, convening work with all the parties over the phone, except with the elder. I go visit the elder in person. And um, and so distance doesn't really matter in that phase. And then when we all come together, uh, I find out where and what general geographic area is most convenient for people. You know, if the elder is involved themselves, which sometimes their dementia is too far, they can't participate. But if they are gonna be at the meeting, even for part of the meeting, then obviously we try to do it close to where they are. And otherwise, you know, when families are spread out, we look for a place that's like a good compromise solution for everybody. And I can go to a private home if that feels like a safe, neutral place to everybody involved. But oftentimes, you know, if like the sister that lives centrally, not everybody has a good relationship with, that doesn't feel like a good, neutral place. Uh, or the family home may have emotional associations too, you know. So then I find uh, a place nearby where we can meet. Like where we're meeting here today, this is an estate planning attorney's office who I have a relationship with and she lets me use that comfort, her conference room. Which is probably a lot better than like a Starbucks. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it has to be, it has to be a, a safe and, and quiet location. And also well lit is important, you know, as you know, with elders, you know, when they can't see so well anymore, when they can't hear so well anymore, it's important that it's carpeting, that it's quiet, that there's good lighting, anything I can do to increase the elders' ability to fully participate. That's not even something I would have, I would know not to take mom to someplace noisy, because mm -hmm. one, she would complain, but two, it's just it's hard to concentrate when you've got all this kind of noise going on around you and distractions so there's actually a connection between the different senses so i'm a little hard of hearing and i know that if there's better lighting i hear better too hmm. i was just talking yesterday to a musician that does an online course on music therapy for caregivers and mm -hmm. self-care and and it was really interesting the brain research that he's done it's kind of superficial which is a little bit dismissing what he's done and it was just fascinating just just how music affects you physically and emotionally and stuff yeah. so it's really interesting that you, you hear better when it's better lit that's mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. so how do you help families that have a, are having a conflict when one person's not doesn't think they need to engage a third party? That I can see happening with my household or my that family. That happens a lot. And when I first became a mediator, I didn't know what to do. But then I learned that there is such a thing as conflict coaching, and I've got training in conflict coaching. And now I can work with the one person who wants to change the dynamic and teach them some new communication skills that then have a domino effect on the entire family system. So there is hope even if mm -hmm. we can't. I need to learn about you 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing also is if I do work with one person, 
and they start communicating with the others differently, sometimes what happens is the others say, oh, you sound different. And, she, and she'll make it beauty as a woman say, yeah, I remember um, that person I thought could help our family. Well, she is helping our family because I'm working with her. And then sometimes the others get curious and want to try it too, after all. Well, I can see, like, <laughs> I almost feel like we're in a therapy session for myself here. <laughs> I can see learning how to talk differently to my sister. Like I said, we're polar opposite personalities. So I say something to me is very neutral and, mm -hmm. and non-threatening, not quite the right word, but it's not, it's not confrontational. Mm -hmm. And she hears it as like, ah, an attack. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so, and, and then of course I feel attacked, right? It's not all yeah. good, so. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the kind of situation we work with in conflict coaching. Both teaching new skills and then trying them out with lots of role playing. So if we've got to do this, you, you could play your sister and you could play yourself and you could see how it feels. So it's, 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 a, it's a very powerful process and I enjoy a lot to see the changes. I can understand that. I just find it really fascinating because it's, you're approaching a problem from a, like a different path. And it's, oh, like I said, I should have found out about you many, many years ago. It helped all of our family. I recently, I want to give you a specific example without breaching confidentiality. Um, I recently worked with a person um, who my client was the power of attorney for health care and the sibling was the power of attorney for finances. And my client uh, lived with the parent. So invested a lot of time and wanted, and it affected my client's ability, you know, to have the income you know, to work. that they needed. Right. So they were trying to negotiate some subsidy for themselves and were not getting anywhere. And again, their initial idea was for me to bring the two siblings together and the other sibling wouldn't do it. But we had just four, I think, phone sessions together. And at the end, um, they had another meeting with the two siblings. And she negotiated what she wanted all along. That's awesome. Yeah, so it can really make a big difference. Because it's, it's difficult. What I hear a lot of times, the people I talk to and friends and support group, attendees is that there's always this this conflict over money and it's like oh it's so frustrating that's why I'm being slightly a control freak I would prefer not to have to share duties with my sister but we're both in charge of the money mm -hmm. and we both approach money differently so like I said we've done really good so far yeah. and but I'm in charge of mom's health care I know why my dad did that I get to make the hard decisions mm -hmm. and if if you just knew my sister and I briefly, you would think that she would be better off at making the hard decisions, but it's, it's not, that's not the way it is. And I think part of it, because she's got younger kids, it's a little harder to, mm -hmm. to let go. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's interesting. Yeah. Are most of your mediations over money? Um, I wouldn't say most of my mediations are about money. Uh, I would say money is probably a factor with most families at some point, either the money you know, for my services or something else. But I believe that, that money tends to be the presenting problem, but it's not the real problem. That I can totally see. So, you know, for example, like, somebody getting more money from a parent than another that means to people you know the parent loves, loves them more but it may not be about that at all it may be about something else right so that's just an example so and this doesn't just go for money I think in a lot of cases what people say it's about is not what it ends up being ends up being about 
deeper relational issues. Well, as I say, I can see wanting to be in control of, say, the money and be the healthcare power of attorney because it's hard to let go. It's it's hard to accept. Like, it's hard to deal with what's going on with my mom. She's yeah. declined a lot over the summer. Yeah. And that's, it's, I mean, it's, it's expected, but when it happens, you're still surprised. And it's like, what the heck? So and being able to make decisions isn't so much about making the decisions, but it's about having a sense of control, having some sort of power in a situation that makes you feel powerless. Just getting all kinds of little light bulbs going <laughs> off just talking to you. So how does somebody become an elder care mediator? I'm not going to take your job, so. <laughs> <laughs> not worried about that. Um, well, unfortunately, there's going to need to be a lot more of you in the near future, I'm there sure. There is a huge need, but as I said, the biggest problem is people don't know that people like me exist, and they don't know how much size, uh, time and money and emotional pain we can save them, you know, otherwise people would be knocking at my door, which they're not. So I'm really glad about this opportunity. Um, how does one become an elder care mediator? Most people uh, become a mediator first for whatever reason and then um, realize how elder care is becoming such a big issue and decide to add that to their practice. For me it was the other way around. I was you know, as I was in my 50s a long time ago, <laughs> approaching my 50s. Um, I was looking f to make a career change and I really wanted to do something that I felt I could do until for a really long time. Yeah, I can relate to that. I don't that. think I'll ever retire. And so I thought, okay, something in the aging field would be great because it's a growing field and uh, having more life experience is an asset rather than a liability, as in a lot of other professions. And so I spent a year really researching, going to conferences, workshops, networking events, to find out what's out there in the, in the field of aging. And then I met somebody who talked about elder mediation, and I was hooked because <laughs> I've spent my entire adult life uh, involved in organizations that promote consensus. And so that's my natural way of being. And so helping other people f find consensus essentially seems like a really good fit. Also, the profession isn't, uh, isn't regulated in California. And so it doesn't take a ton of training to start a mediation business. I mean, I, I have a ton of training at this point, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you need it because just, you know, end of life issues and family issues and I'm like oh that's just you got man, yeah, a lot of landmines to avoid yeah it's the factual information that's really important but also the 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 communication tools you know to learn them and to practice them um, I've been one of the uh, tools that I found most helpful in my practice um, I ran across like over 10 years ago a training in what was then called nonviolent communication based mediation. It's now called Mediate Your Life, which I like a lot better. Yeah, that sounds a little, <laughs> little bit nicer. Uh, but nonviolent communication, or it's also known as compassionate communication, is a specific communication method that was uh, over 50 years ago developed by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, and it's been taught all around the world. Um, to use in any kind of context, not just in a, in a you know, in a case of uh, where there's already conflict, but it's really designed to get people out of their heads and into their hearts and to connect on a deeper level in any kind of conversation, at home, at work, with friends, anywhere. And that has turned out to be one of the most important tools in my toolkit, because especially um, with people who are somewhere on the journey of dementia, as you know, what's so hard for us in this um, very brain-oriented society is to adjust to a relationship with somebody when you can't reason anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And compassion communication really helps with that because it gets people out of their heads into their heart 
and you can still connect on a heart level. Mm -hmm. And I know you know that from firsthand experience. And that's one, one thing I wanted to share with you, that that's really an important tool for me because it helps people in this situation so much. Yeah, I've, I've talked to, well, some guests, they've learned, obviously, but again, people that I've met through where my mom lives or my support group, and it's like, you can, you can almost see, it's like, they're trying to logic through a situation that you can't. I mean, yes, mom's not paying her bills because she can't remember she didn't pay the bills and she thinks people are stealing money over checking account. These are all really common stories. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously a, a factual situation you have to deal with, but you can't deal with it in a logical and factual way. You have to deal with it in a different way. And so I can see how just learning that would help somebody in my situation navigate through the journey because it's already hard enough. Yeah. You know, the other day my mom said something, it was words, and she spoke it very quietly. And so we were at the park because she loves to watch the kids. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear all of that. And so she repeated it, but then she kind of trailed off and I thought, is she still thinking? What's, because it wasn't an actual cohesive sentence. And when I realized that she was done and waiting for a response, I, I again apologized and she just, oh my gosh, snapped at me. She was like, you sit still and you can be quiet. And I was like, okay, I am not four. It was like, you could just see all of the hackles standing up and it was really hard to, to dial back how I felt in that situation and, and try to figure out what was going on with her. She does seem to start getting a little bit aggressive close to the ends of our visit I go once a week after a lunch meeting so it's from like 2 to 4 4 30 they have dinner starting about 4 30 but I'm noticing around 4 o'clock she's kind of getting hostile with me so yeah, <laughs> I have to leave it quarter quarter to four for a while <laughs> I just heard you say um like dial down your emotion um and of course you know, it's not productive to like show your emotion in that situation. And one of the things that I teach people in the compassionate communication um, trainings is, or in conflict coaching, is to first give compassion to yourself. So in that moment when you are feeling understandably triggered, you know, first give compassion to yourself silently. That's not pushing down the emotion, that's allowing yourself to feel them, understand why you're feeling them, what that reminds you of, being treated as a four-year-old, yeah. and all that. And it can be very quick. And then you are centered in yourself, and then you can be open to your mom in a different way. Yeah, that sounds like a good tool. Yeah, she, well, this particular week, my husband suggested that I take a week off. And I said, but, <clears throat> When I go, I'm like, this is not just going to hang out with my mother. I, I check in with the staff and does she need stuff? She needed toilet paper, so we, we handled that. You know, is there, are there issues because she's been getting hostile with the staff and they find it a little surprising because she's been very mellow and easy to deal with and now she's, she snaps at them sometimes. She gets, you know, verbally aggressive is probably the right phrase. Mm -hmm. And they find it surprising and it makes me kind of laugh because my mom is not somebody that you messed around with. Mm -hmm. You know, she was, she was fine as long as everything was going the way it should go. Not necessarily her way, but things were proceeding properly. And now it's like this aggression is new. And so I want to make sure that I'm checking in with them. So I don't take a week off like he suggested. I probably should have rearranged my week because for whatever reason I was really just kind of like it was just one of those days I was just frustrated and just I just it wasn't really the best day to go thankfully we watched the kids in the park that always helps yeah it's you know I really uh, admire what you do for your mom and I know it's a really hard job and um, and you know one of the things that Caregivers tend to forget is to take care of themselves first. So that's something I help with too. Yeah, that is hard. And so 
I just recently read where somebody's like, you know, it doesn't help to just say, well, don't forget to take care of yourself. And it's like, well, it's kind of hard to tell. You need to learn specific ways to do it. I, I am very, I, I swear, I think all my clients must think I'm a complete lazy bum because I'm not usually available until lunchtime. Mm -hmm. It's because I go to the gym three days a week. Yeah, three days a week. And three days a week, I ride my bike. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Yeah, so, and that was one of the reasons for the irritation on Mondays. I didn't even get five miles into a bike ride, and I got my third back tire flat. Mm. And I was like, ugh. And I was at a conference last week, so I didn't work out last week. I'm like, I really need to exercise, just for a lot of reasons. So I, I should have taken my husband's suggestion and rearranged things, but... I'm, I'm very fastidious, and it's like, this is how I've structured my week, and I'm going to stick to it, mm -hmm. even though it probably wasn't the best move, but... Um. Well, um, I, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity, and I want to offer to your, to your listeners that they can give me a call, and we can schedule an hour-long complimentary conversation where they just tell me what's going on for them, and then at the end, we can explore if there's something I can do for them, or I know about a lot of resources too that may be helpful to them. So that's that's a gift I want to give to you. Awesome, I appreciate it. And I want to I'm going to make sure that your phone number and your email are in the show notes so people right. can find it real easily. Um, how would somebody? In another state find somebody like you obviously you're not going to probably travel to New York <laughs> or, I would if somebody wanted me but yes so so he's gonna get a little high <laughs> so um, well sometimes the elder is out there but most of the family members are oh. here so a lot of it can happen here but anyway um, I'll go anywhere but I understand that people in other parts of the country may want to choose someone else and um, the, the, the best way I know how, I mean, you can just Google what you're looking for, but, but a resource that I recommend is Mediate.com. It's an organization that um, provides education and certification and support to mediators, and it also offers listings. So I think it's a really good place to look. You can enter where you are, and where you want, you know, what general area, either the city or the phone number where you want the mediation to happen, and also um, what specialty. So you can enter elder or divorce or whatever it is, and find you know mediators that are certified by Mediate.com. And since you're talking about people anywhere in the world, uh, or the country at least. Oh, I have, um, I have listeners all over the world, which even in non-English speaking countries, which surprises me. They I obviously can't. speak English better yeah. than I speak anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I uh, so far the only languages in which I feel comfortable offering mediation are English and German. Uh -huh. But um, I recently went through a three-day training in online mediation. So um, I'm in the process of becoming a, a certified mediator for online mediation because you know, in elder care, families are spread out so widely that I'd really like to develop my tech skills so I can <laughs> easily invite people to participate wherever they are. I have worked with families where most everybody came together in my area, and then we have one person participate, either by video or audio conference or even phone. So that's worked pretty well, but I, I want to improve my skills in that area to serve more people anywhere in the world. Well, that'd be awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've learned a lot today. There's, Me too. And I haven't done an in-person chat like this in quite, since I kind of started when I was talking to people that were in my own town, and now I talk to people all over the country and northern the North, North America. There's some people in... Britain that I'd like to talk to, but being in California makes it a little challenging to, to coordinate a time frame. So, well, thank you very much for being willing to meet with me in person. I really enjoyed that. One last thing I want to say: um, people tend to want to con connect by email these days, and just something to remember: research shows that only ten percent of our communication is communicated in writing. 
about a third is by tone of voice, so phone helps, mm -hmm. and over half is body language, eye contact. So that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy meeting in person whenever possible because the quality of connection is just different. That is very true. Well, this has been great. Thank, Thank you so you. much.